I think I'm live. Um, can the technicians confirm that you can hear me and see me? Because I don't. I see Ana Gomez. All good? Okay, I will trust that I am visible and, uh, and audible. Uh, good afternoon. Um, I'm Margie Mandel, and uh, I'm here speaking on behalf of Carrie Polanyi Levitt, who uh, has written um, a text to introduce our keynote speaker today, Quinn Slobodian. I'll just put in a little comment to welcome Quinn uh, to this conference. Uh, we're very we're delighted that you were able to accept. Um, Pre-COVID, we tried very hard to. Uh, bring you to various uh, events and timing was not right. So here we are now on the screen and we look forward to having you uh, at, in Montreal as, as soon as that becomes possible. So uh, it's an honor for me to read um, Carrie Polanyi's Levitt's uh, introduction to your keynote address. Quinn Slobodian is a Canadian citizen and historian working at Wellesley, Wellesley College in Massachusetts. He's the author of Globalists, The End of Empire and the Birth of Neoliberalism, published by Harvard University Press in 2018. Recently, his interests have focused on Corona politics and conspiracy in North America and Germany. The Slobodian family immigrated to Canada from Galicia before the First World War, part of the first of three waves of immigrants from this region during the 20th century. Approximately 150,000 Ukrainian immigrants arrived between 1891 and 1914. Most settled in Manitoba, Saskatchewan, and Alberta. Slobodian's family landed as farmers in the province of Manitoba. <clears throat> they would later find a spot in British, British Columbia to call home. The second wave of immigrants from Ukrainian Galicia occurred after the First World War when Ukraine joined by the Soviet Union in 1922. Before the Second World War, the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact divided Poland between Germany and the Ukraine, which was part of the Soviet Union. By the end of the war, Canada was eager to accept any number of Ukrainian immigrants and give them land in Western Canada, bordering the Canadian Pacific Railway to increase wheat production for shipment to Britain, which constituted the third wave. Quinn Slobodian completed his undergraduate studies in history on a scholarship at Lewis and Clark College near Portland, Oregon. He received his PhD from New York University and his dis dissertation focused on third world politics in 1960s Germany, which he developed into a book entitled Foreign Front, Third World Politics in 60s West Germany, published by Duke University Press in 2012. Quinn was interested in investigating leftist movements in Berlin during the Cold War. His work required familiarity with the German language. He spent much time in Berlin learning written and spoken German. I became aware of Quinn Slobodian from reading his very important book, Globalists, The End of Empire and the Birth of Neoliberalism. The title accurately summarizes what the book is about. The defeat of the Central European powers in the First World War combined with the popular view that the newly formed nation states should have sovereignty and self-determination caused the Austrian economist Ludwig von Mises a great deal of fear. Mises worried that the establishment of these new nation states would undermine the property rights of foreign investors because national governments would claim that their populations had the right to own and control their own national resources. He anticipated that the nation states would intervene on behalf of their citizens to reclaim this property. Mises found many similarly concerned individuals in Geneva and together with the International Chamber of Commerce, they argued the case for international laws to protect private property within the new nation states. They advocated for the establishment of a new international authority resembling the World Trade Organization. Mises was a regular attendee at meetings of the Mount of the Mont Pelerin Society established by his protege, Frederic Hayek. 
the end of empire did not apply exclusively to the decline of the Central European empires, but gained contemporary relevance at the end of the Second World War. These concerns became more topical as former colonies gained independence and a small number of African nations joined the United Nations with voting powers equal to that of their former colonial masters, Britain, France, and Portugal. Mises, Hayek, and the Montpellerin crowd in Geneva were distressed to see the former colonies with powers equal to that of established European states. As a result, they were hostile to the United Nations call to establish a new international economic order and other similar effects. Their resistance was successful and globalization would come to displace international cooperation. Quinslobodian's recent research has investigated the phenomenon of the populist far right in Germany and in the United States. In an article published in the Boston Review, co-authored with William Callison entitled Corona Politics from the Reichstag to the Capital, Slobodian describes the similarities between the revolt of Mittelstand and the Kerdenken in Germany with QAnon and the attack on the capital in America. He, he concludes his piece by writing and carry quotes, where 2017 brought a reckoning with populism, then 2021 may be dominated by discussions of diagonalism and conspiracy. Diagonal movements may bring bad news to established parties that are forced to navigate their disorienting energies with unpredictable effects. Pundits trying to make spider charts of rabbit holes may find themselves nostalgic for the days when their populist quarry had an easily identifiable name, a leader and a face, end quote. It is my pleasure to introduce Clint Slobodian for his keynote address on the market golem, Polanyi, Schmidt, anti-globalism. Welcome, Quinn Slobodian. Hi, uh, Margie, thank you so much for that. And of course, thank you above all to Carrie Polanyi Levitt for helping to make this reality and for um, remaining such a vital intellectual living link between the world and the work that we all spend so much time trying to understand in our present. So it feels very special to be here and I'm very happy to take part. So I'm gonna talk for about 30 minutes or so, and then I'll be mostly interested to have a conversation because I see that some of the people who are really the experts on the question of Polanyi are among us. Um, what I've decided I wanted to use my time today to do was to sit a bit with the metaphors that Karl Polanyi uses to think about the economy. I wanted to do this because I think that much of the confusion, which of course can be a productive confusion around his arguments has to do with precisely this question of metaphor. The question of metaphor, I think also usually circles around this notion of the self-regulating market. Now this term, which we of course all associate with Polanyi is actually more novel than it might appear. Um, Polanyi is actually the first person to use it, which I think is, you know, you know, quite obvious when one just sort of does the, does the research, but it, it seems to me almost that it should be remarked on more, that this term is not something that he is sort of, oh, merely reproducing from the material that he's interested in, but one that he's in fact sort of coining and fashioning himself. Because I think this idea is so powerful, however, the idea of the self-regulating market, I think it has grown to kind of colonize the scholarly and the kind of vernacular, more popular understanding of the point that Polanyi is making. And this doesn't always have the outcome of greater clarity. So to set this up a little, I, I'm convinced by the argument that Fred Block and Margaret Summers, who I'm happy to see are here, I'm convinced by their argument that Polanyi is performing this kind of three-step. I think it's a three-step that goes something like this, if I can try to reproduce his and their argument. First, the discipline of economics presupposes a self-regulating market that seeks equilibrium and a perfect correspondence between supply and demand mediated by the price mechanism. That's the first statement. But this is a conjecture, of course. 
within a specific epistemological field, the field of neoclassical economics. The second step in the Polanyi three step is the unmasking of this conjecture. The famous observation that laissez-faire was planned, institutions are always necessary, markets are always embedded, self-regulating markets could only be a fantasy because otherwise humanity would be ground to dust, the iron fist of violent conquest, accompanies the creation of new markets, et cetera, et cetera. All of the important work that people do in the field of economic sociology and the global history of capitalism works especially, I think, in the register of the second point, the unmasking of the conjecture. But of course, there is the third step. And the third step is that the fantasy, notwithstanding its nature as a fantasy, has real effects. As the wonderful historian Gareth Dale quotes Polanyi saying, quote, it is a spectral world in which the specters are real, end quote. In other words, the very attempt to realize this fantastical conjecture ends up transforming all of our lives. And I think Bloch and Summers are persuasive here when they see that this is a kind of a forerunner of what we now call the theory of performativity in economic sociology. But I also have a dissatisfaction with the way that these conversations around the self-regulating market go, even as I acknowledge the internal consistency of this three-step that Polanyi takes. My argument or my fear is that the discussions of the self-regulating market can tend to a kind of a circularity. And as some critics like Martin Konings and Melinda Cooper have pointed out, the use of the term can tend to reify the very division that Polanyi is seeking to undo. So this, you know, this is something I talk about in the introduction to my book in an attempt not to so much criticize Polanyi because I, I actually go out of my way to point out that we should see Polanyi as a kind of a contemporary of the early neoliberals of the 20s and 30s in the sense that they're both seeking embeddedness of a different kind. But more as a critique of a certain kind of folk reception of Polanyi, let's say, which takes as given that something like a self-regulating market is actually out there or that is actually sort of coming into being in a way that um, disembeds it from the institutions of the state and law that we all know are required for the continued existence of the market. So you can see here, I'm already kind of reproducing the problem of the circularity. So in preparing for this lecture, I wanted to say, how can I think my way out of this constant tarrying with the metaphor of the self-regulating market? My solution was to go in search of different metaphors within Polanyi's writing. And the one that jumps out, the one that I'll be focusing on today, which is in the title, is specifically that of the golem, with the related metaphors that he uses of the giant, the automaton, the man machine. And there's a wonderful quote from Polanyi, a letter from 1960, in this wonderful collection of his Hungarian writings, that distills down much of what I want to draw attention to today. In the letter, Polanyi writes, quote, the blessing and the curse of the machine is what set us on this road. Our destiny was to become a society that, thanks to the power of machines, has grown into a giant, but one that renders the individual powerless, end quote. So what I want to do today is a bit of an excavation of Polanyi's use of this metaphor, specifically of the golem, the automaton, the giant, and I want to do so by way of a comparison with a contemporary of his. They were born within two years of each other, who is also interested in this matter, but who is someone we don't usually think of in relationship to Karl Polanyi. That is another Karl, Karl Schmidt. I think by putting these two figures together in this short time I have, we can find something interesting. We can find out how they both use this metaphor of the golem, but in very different ways. Schmidt thought about the problem of the golem in relation to the state, specifically in his 1938 book on Hobbes's Leviathan. Schmidt says three different times that the Leviathan as state is often feared as growing into a Moloch or a golem. There's another point he says, quote, an all demanding Moloch or an all trampling golem. Polanyi, by contrast, thought about the golem in relationship to the market and the economy. These are, of course, the two autonomous spheres that Schmidt and Polanyi both saw the 19th century invested in creating and then separating from one another 
the space of the economy on the one hand and the space of the state on the other. These are of course otherwise known by the Kantian and Roman categories that Schmidt uses in the Nomos of the Earth that I talk about some in my book. The domains of dominium on the one hand, the sphere of property and ownership, and imperium, the space of government and sovereignty on the other. Schmidt puts the golem in the space of imperium, Polanyi puts it in the space of dominium. What we find, as we'll see by comparing, I think, Polanyi and Schmidt, is that they use the golem differently. And yet, their political geography, curiously, ends up in a very similar place by the end of the Second World War. And this is something that I haven't seen remarked on, except uh, perhaps in passing here and there. We'll see that by the end of the Second World War, both Schmidt and Polanyi fear that the universalism of the United States is what has become the bearer of this golem-like spirit. Both ended up fearing that the United States was the man machine incarnate and that its global conception of its own mandate in the world was something that needed to be militated against and prevented from realization. Both Polanyi and Schmidt became proponents of what we could call a pluriverse. Schmidt called his proposal that of great spaces or Großräume in German, and Polanyi called them tame empires in the title of the book that he proposed to follow up the great transformation. Schmidt ended the war writing an article called Great Spaces Against Universalism. Polanyi ended the Second World War writing an article called Universal Capitalism or Regional Planning, covering very similar ground, coming, strangely enough, to very similar conclusions. I think that we can understand this by dwelling a bit on the metaphor of the golem. In Polanyi, in the case of Polanyi, we can also draw connections between periods of his life that are often kept separate from one another. <clears throat> Polanyi's life in Budapest after the First World War, when he helped to launch the radical bourgeois party, is often seen as a distinct era from his later turn to democratic socialism in Vienna, London, the US, and Canada. But after spending quite a lot of time reading him, largely in preparation for this talk, I actually don't think that this division is very tenable. And part of my argument today is that we can not only draw this sort of interesting synchronic uh, connection between Schmidt and Polanyi in terms of their political geography by the end of the Second World War, but also we can follow this kind of diachronic um, con continuity in the way Polanyi thought about the problems of political organization from his earlier years, immediately after the First World War, up until the end of the Second World War. So how are we gonna do this? Let's think about the metaphor of the Gala. Why is it circulating in their writing of both of these two authors who are otherwise unrelated to each other? Neither quotes the other as far as I know. Well, as it turns out, the metaphor of the Gollum, which was primarily inhabited the world of Jewish folk tales until the 19th century, had a moment during the First World War. The scholar Maya Barzilai has written a whole book on this, credits this primarily to the novel called The Gollum by Gustav Meyrink, which was published in 1916, which sold 200,000 copies. She called it the Da Vinci Code of its day. There was also a series of successful films made in German studios on the topic of the Gollum. Why were they popular during the First World War? It doesn't take that much um, reflection to see why, right? All of the texts have this motif of the strong protector turned into a violent destroyer technologically enabled humanity turning its own weapons and tools on itself for the forced causes of destruction. Gareth Dale has Polanyi writing to Irma after the First World War, although his footnote is wrong, I tried to follow it up, that quote, humanity is a golem, which stares with horror at its own frozen mask, a tortured soul at the terrible machine. He's using it there in the way that it was almost always used around the First World War. A technologically uh, armored and enabled cyborg juggernaut of which the thinking mind of humans had lost control. Over the years, 
Polanyi would use a similar metaphor to describe this autonomous sphere of the market in just this way. Perhaps the most famous example of this is the passage in The Great Transformation, when he writes that, quote, world trade now meant in the 19th century, the organizing of life on the planet under a self-regulating market, comprising labor, land, and money with the gold standard as the guardian of this gargantuan automaton. Nations and puppet peoples were mere puppets in the show utterly beyond their control. We can see in a passage like this how Polanyi skips happily between the three different registers that I described at the beginning. This is simultaneously a conjecture, but it's also a real conjecture and one that despite its fantastic essence is producing a real life cataclysm to use another of his favorite terms. Polanyi's writing of course is at its most powerful when he shows in vivid detail the dirty business in the movement between these two registers in the movement to make the fantasy real. It's also here that he gives us another handhold for his use of the metaphor of the golem. In his description of the process of colonization and the great transformation, Polanyi writes that, quote, the natives are forced to make a living by selling their labor. Thus, the colonists may decide to cut the breadfruit trees down in order to create an artificial food scarcity or may impose a tax on the natives to force them to barter away their own labor. He sees this, of course, in a continuity with preceding eras of capitalism, quote, what the white man may still occasionally practice in remote regions today, namely the smashing up of social structures in order to extract the element of labor from them, was done in the 18th century to white populations by white men for similar purposes. And here he points out himself the difference between his vision and that of Hobbes, the one that Schmidt writes of. Polanyi writes, quote, Hobbes's grotesque vision of the state, a human leviathan whose vast body was made up of an infinite number of human bodies, was dwarfed by the Ricardian construct of the labor market, a flow of human lives, the supply of which was regulated by the amount of food put at their disposal, end quote. So what Polanyi was describing then on the ground in the process of enclosure or colonialism was a process of disassembling and reassembling a kind of techno-surgery. As he puts it, quote, the project was, quote, to detach man from the soil, which meant the dissolution of the body economic into its elements so that each element could fit into that part of the system where it was most useful, end quote. This is literally the production of a kind of a patchwork humanoid. The Ricardian golem dwarfs, as he puts it, the Hobbesian Leviathan, because the state is only ever one segment of the world's territory. The Ricardian golem swallows the whole thing. It's composed of human components from all of the world's habitable surface. This question of scale, I think, is essential because it draws attention to the question of how one controls the golem. If the golem was once useful to humankind and has since escaped human control, how do we re subordinate the golem to human control. I think we can understand Polanyi's entire political project and arguably the political project of people who follow in his footsteps as a problem of taming the golem. And I say taming advisedly because I don't think his desire is to kill or to slay it. If you think of the golem or the self-regulating automaton as the domain of the economy as conceived in his narrowly neoclassical sense, and even this is not something that Polanyi wants to see vanish from the earth. This is where I think it helps to hark back to his 1918, early 1920s days. He brought with him from his classical liberal moment, which you could call it, a sense of the global quality of the world economy, right? The Ricardian golem that is at the scale of the planet. This is a vision which is, of course, corresponding clearly with the work of people like Ludwig von Mises and Friedrich Hayek, and at the time, Polanyi was also adopting and continued to adopt their belief in the utility of the price mechanism. One of the ways that I think Polanyi is misrecognized by people who want to see political economic imaginaries in term of, terms of overly strict binaries, that he doesn't fit well into overly strict binaries. For Polanyi, it's not a question of either commodification of everything or the decommodification of everything. 
Indeed, as I'm sure everyone on this call knows, Polanyi accepted the commodification of some things, but famously not all of them, not the so-called fictitious commodities of land, labor, and money. That did not mean to do away with the price mechanism or markets as such. The golem of the commodity logic was a problem in its grotesque hypertrophy, its, its excessive size. This though was the object, I think, of the vexed lifelong engagement for Polanyi, the question of scale. How big was too big? What were the limits of the market? What could be absorbed into this monstrous assemblage of its body and what could not, what must not? How could the automaton be prevented from slipping the bonds of its human masters? I think he basically came up with two solutions. And both, I think, of these solutions tell us something about core principles in Polanyi's thinking. The first solution was to give the golem a mind. The bracingly counterintuitive quality of Polanyi's writing right after the First World War lies in how strongly he was opposing the lionization of the working class. Why would he be skeptical of the wisdom of the workers in 1918, 1919? Well, they had marched happily into war. Socialist internationalism had proven to be a paper tiger. So he came to the conclusion after the First World War that it must be the intellectual workers and not the manual workers who are the key political class to address and to recruit. Their work, Polanyi wrote, was more taxing than that of manual laborers. Physical work, he wrote in 1919, turns the human body into a machine. And such work ought not to be idealized, but abolished. Intellectual labor, by contrast, was the most exhausting, most excruciating, and most productive labor. In the end, he argued, it was also more important than manual labor. Quote, it was the organizer and director of other kinds of labor the originator and guarantor of the productivity of all other forms of labor. It was, he said, quote, the entrepreneurs, the industrialists, the merchants, end quote, who came up with new ways to mobilize human resources, to organize collective action, to engineer social outcomes. These were the true Promethean figures in the body politic, and it was they who he believed needed to be courted for any successful political project. In this sense, and at this time, he had a lot in common with someone like Hayek, who similarly believed that there was a privileged class of intellectually adept thinkers who had a special role to play in producing a productive and stable future for a market-based system. Hayek and Polanyi also have a similarity at this time in the sense that part of the project was about persuading people who did not think of themselves as intellectuals that they were in fact intellectuals. What Polanyi was staging in his concentration on winning over the business leader, the shopkeeper, the investor, was to the idea that they were part of the intellectual working class. He was, to use some of the jargon that is more common these days, staging a full-throated defense of what we call now the professional managerial class, calling what we call the PMC, the vanguard of any political mobilization. Why? Because, I think that he believed that the working class was fated to become appendages of the golem. Physical work turns the body into a machine, as he put it. They did not have the means to resist their own incorporation into the automaton. The self-regulating market then as market golem was pure private ordering by an entrepreneurial and financial class which had failed to recognize its own status as a governing class in UK. The problem was that the 19th century market was led by an acephalic bourgeoisie filled with disavowed intellectual workers. Given this absence of a head, when endowed with the power of the machine, they formed an unreflective block with the workers themselves and they ran amok. This was the failure of the hand to recognize its need for a head. Seeing this aspect of Polanyi as a prophet of, I think, radical intellectual workerism helps explain his ongoing popularity up to this day. I do think that someone like Thomas Piketty is a perfect heir to a particular understanding 
uh, perhaps even this early Polanyi as someone who believes that the golem could be tamed by giving it a brain. The messages persuade the elites, persuade the policymaking class, produce better technocrats, do what you can to foment a new elite consensus about how the golem can be slowed in its omnivorous path, you can be brought to work for people instead of people working for it, have the markets work for us instead of us working for the markets, escaping a world where, quote, prices rule everything, but nobody ruled them, as Polanyi put it in 1922. We know all of these familiar reversals from the pages of the left liberal and the financial press, right? So if one of the solutions is to give the golem a brain, by which we can say he means to convert parts of the business elite and conscript them into the project of stabilizing a market-based order, then the other more radical and perhaps more interesting proposal comes from his ideas about political geography by the end of the Second World War. It's quite amazing to follow the rapid changes in Polanyi's visions for international order in the 1930s and 1940s. And Gareth Dale, as I'm sure many of you know, has a wonderful article about this on which I partially build here. We can see a rapid change in a short period of time in Polanyi's writings. At the beginning of the Second World War, Polanyi remained what you would call a pretty staunch globalist, not of the kind of Hayek and Mises, a globalist more of the social democratic variety. He adhered to the belief that was common at the time and since that problems that were global needed global solutions. He believed that the League of Nations was a failure because of its lack of support by the leading powers, not because of its attempt to take on a universal role. That was fine, that was necessary. In that sense, he was of peace with the kind of the Council on Foreign Relations, the sort of Geneva mentality of the need for some kind of global cooperation. He believed that the nation state was an obsolete container for politics in an interdependent world. Kind of stuff that people like Eugene Staley, Pittman Potter, the International Studies Conferences organized by the League of Nations. This was a kind of a consensus for people. And it didn't mean you were on the right. It didn't mean you were a neoliberal. It was kind of a centrist consensus. To give a couple of quotes, in 1935, Polanyi said, quote, the actual forms of material existence of man are those of worldwide interdependence. The political forms of human existence must also be worldwide, either within the boundaries of a world empire or in those of a world federation either through conquest and subjection or by international cooperation. The nations of the globe must be brought within the folds of one embracing body if our civilization is to survive." End quote. In 1938, he spoke out directly against the idea of national self-sufficiency. He said it would create only mass death and it would require populations to bear more hardship than they would ever consent to. He then put his faith in something more than the nation state and was a real critic of what he called the Lilliputian nations created by the post-First World War settlement, criticizing the successor states of the Habsburg Empire for their misguided and myopic demands for national self-control. What was fascinating though, is that by the end of the Second World War, a matter of a few years later, albeit extraordinarily tumultuous years, he's begun to propose something very different. And what he's come to propose is interesting, not only for itself, but also because it's provided inspiration to people more recently. When Danny Roderick gave a keynote at this very meeting two years ago, he began by drawing attention to this 1945 text of Polanyi. The sociologist Wolfgang Strake, who has been broadly critical of most polls of the political spectrum in the last few years, found this 1945 text by Polanyi is something that he could identify with. He saw it as an inspiration to himself for future political geographies. What does this short text from 1945 say? Well, quite amazingly, I would say that it proposes that the golem must be dismembered for humanity to live. The global market must be rendered into pieces. Polanyi talked more than once in his proposal, and I'm working now from the, the archival proposal for, for the book, Tame Empires. He talks more than once in his proposal for autark or autarkic empires. These are the way he describes the Tame Empires. What would they look like? He saw the world divided into a series of regions, 
quote, the United States, Latin America, the British Commonwealth, German Central Europe, Jan Smuts's colonial zones, referring to the former leader of South Africa, India, China, and other regions. The tame empire, he said, need not be any more a utopia, end quote. And we know that utopia is a strong word for him, one that he would not have chosen lightly. The Great Transformation was originally titled the liberal utopia, and the self-regulating market itself, which I think one can also see as the global market golem, is something that he saw as a utopia in the negative sense. But here in the tame empire is a utopia that Polanyi is willing to defend, one that can be brought down to earth, and it's based on the principle of autarky. And here is where the remarkable meeting with Carl Schmidt happens. Because the end of the Second World War, they disagreed in the specifics, but they end up agreeing on the outcome. How did they disagree in the specifics? Schmidt thought that the Soviet Union was a universalist power seeking world communism and claimed that national socialism, by contrast, was not a universalist ideology but only sought control of what he called the great space, using a term not only used by him, but many at the time, the great space of Central Europe. Polanyi thought the exact opposite. He thought that National Socialism was a universalist project based on a vision of what he called, quote, racial domination. But he thought that the Soviet Union, by the 1940s, after the expulsion of Trotsky and his version of world revolution, was no longer universalist in its aspirations. He believed that the Soviet Union was a regional power. By the mid-1940s, it had claims over its near abroad of Eastern Europe, but no particular mandate to expand beyond that. So Schmidt and Polanyi seemed, on, on the face of it, to be at perfect odds. One sees Nazism as universalist, the other one sees it as particularist and regional. One sees Soviet Union as regional, the other sees it as universalist and world swallowing. But they come together in one point. And where is that? The United States. Carl Schmitt famously saw the liberalism of Woodrow Wilson and its universalism as denying politics, as casting the enemy not just as an adversary, but as someone beyond and outside of the human community as such. His whole support for national socialism was at least on paper justified as the need for a bulwark against this version of what he saw as world swallowing end of human meaning and human difference. Polanyi for his part, although he was, as we have just discussed, a devout globalist of his own into the 1930s, saw the US by 1945 as the privileged descendant of the 19th century. The standard bearer of what had been British centered world economy, which was, as is now clear, the world economy of the market Gollum, the Ricardian global Gollum. Both Schmidt and Polanyi in 1945 see the United States as the prime enemy. And they both have the same solution. Don't let them take over the world. As Polanyi put it in 1945, quote, the British Commonwealth and the USSR form part of a new system of regional powers, while the United States insists on a universalist conception of world affairs, which tallies with her antiquated liberal economy. Americans still believe in a way of life no longer supported by the common people in the rest of the world, but which nevertheless implies a universality, which commits those who believe in it to reconquer the globe on its behalf." End quote. Under American leadership, he said that, quote, at the heart of world politics, there is a universalistic conspiracy to make the world safe for the gold standard, end quote. Both Schmidt and Polanyi believed in the need for a pluriverse, going beyond what Polanyi called the, quote, racial jigsaw puzzle of Wilsonian self-determination toward larger regional economic groupings. Although, of course, of course, in Polanyi's case, not along the basis of a strict racialized hierarchy as envisioned by Schmidt, who saw the Monroe Doctrine of the Western Hemisphere as the only working um, forerunner. So where does that leave us? Both were skeptical of the implications of uni American universalism which moved Gollum-like towards global conquest, even against its better judgment. Thinking about it the through, you know, from the present of 2021, it's diagnostically interesting to see that when we look around, no matter what kind of radical demands are being made in 
I think political economic consensus is an uproar right now, actually. I think it's being upended. But even then, very few, if any, people are demanding autarky of the kind that Schmidt and Polanyi were entertaining. That remains a no-go zone for political imagination in the 21st century, in spite of all the talk of decoupling, delinking, deglobalization, and so on. I think trying to square that moment and this moment, it's also worth returning to some of Schmidt's own oppositions. As he wrote in the 1940s before the war ended and again after it had, the land and the sea binary, which he thinks had structured world order for hundreds of years, no longer held. Land and sea were now joined by the new space of the air and the new phenomenon of air power, especially important, of course, in the age of the nuclear bomb. It's easy to misconstrue today's global geoeconomic confrontation, I think, in these same terms, as a sinocentric mega regional order facing an Atlanticist mega regional order, a reprisal of land, the Eurasian space of land, against the Atlantic space of the ocean. China itself plays up this impression by its repeated use of the Silk Road and its messaging and its description of its own cargo trains across Eurasia as, quote, steel camels poised to replace the container ships trapped in the bottlenecks of 19th century waterways, thinking of the ever given from a few weeks back now. But of course, the Belt and Road Initiative is also seaborne and includes a series of deep water harbors. So the land and sea uh, opposition doesn't really hold. And more importantly, it's digital. It implies a space bound by infrastructure, but also one that captures movements and actions as they range through three dimensions. So here, I think it's worth thinking about another invocation of the Gollum as we move to a conclusion. Here's the Gollum of Norbert Wiener, the American father of cybernetics. In his 1964 book, God and Gollum Incorporated, what made the Gollum distinctive for Wiener was not that it was more powerful than us or that it had some movement towards a pre-programmed directives of accumulation or destruction or only needed to be given a mind in the sense of a new elite business class um, providing guidance. It wasn't just that it was quantitatively different, the Hulk, or the Frankenstein's monster, but it was qualitatively different too. Wiener's Gollum was a computer. It saw differently than us. He distinguished between the pictorial image and the operative image. The operative image, as he put it, performs the functions of the original but may or may not bear a pictorial likeness to the original. The German filmmaker Harun Faroki would later call these operational images, machines creating images for use by other machines. The use of satellite technology to produce knowledge about territories that wasn't strictly representational. The use of heat maps and data points on the human face to see patterns and behavior that are inscrutable to the normal naked human eye. The attraction of Polanyi's Gollum, of course, is its absolute inversion of the Hayekian vision of a sublime and unknowable economy as catalaxy. Polanyi's Gollum isn't about an operative image or an escape from the limits of human vision. His Gollum offers what Dale said, points out was clear, was important to Polanyi, the, over, the overview, the Übersicht. But it also made the market monstrous kind of quasi-human assemblage of economic epistemology, private ordering, unreflective labor power. But this is also, in Norbert Wiener's term, a pictorial image. It's an image that looks the way humans see. So as a metaphor, it works within our own understanding of the visual. What is challenging about Wiener's own idea of the operative image is asks us to see how the golem sees, which as he says, quote, may or may not bear a pictorial likeness to the original. So I wonder what it would like, what it would look like to travel with Polanyi and Schmidt out of the industrial age and into the digital one, when the man machine is not made of stovepipes and turbines and grain threshers and coal hoppers, like the Iron Giant or the Tin Woodsman, which is the version that one gets the impression of in the, in the metaphor of Gollum and Schmidt and Polanyi, but a Gollum made out of coaxial cables, motherboards, and sensors. If land and sea are obsolete binaries, no longer tenable in the 20th century, 
then perhaps the opposing spheres of economy and state are too. How can we sort of dance out of the line of the three-step that Polanyi has taught us and come up with new metaphors tailored to the problematics of our time? That's the question I would like to leave you with today. And other than that, I look forward to a conversation. Thank you. Uh, I don't know about the rest of the many people who are online with you, um, Quinn, but uh, I'm left breathless. Um, uh, by your talk, thank you so much. And as we would say here, it's it, this was a, a, a lecture magistral um, that one would like to read carefully and and uh, and digest. You have um, thrown out so many uh, interesting and and original perspectives, um, and also revisited more familiar perspectives using a different language, using different metaphors. Um, uh, which is very, very, uh, very uh, inspiring. I see that there are uh, two questions, um, or and they're both from the same person. Um, Jer uh, Jerome Nikolai Warren. Hi, Quinn. Thanks for your, as usual, lovely talk. To what extent can such symbols or metaphors as golem be useful in uh, actually uncovering what is often concealed or hidden in scientific discourse. As you mentioned, Schmidt and Polanyi had different visions of golems. Such, uh, can such foundational metaphors help unearth true epistemological divisions and thereby enable discourse to actually move forward? That's a light question. Hmm. Should we combine it with the second one? Okay. Also, could you return to some of your discussion of utopian projects, as you did in your book, uh, Globalists? To what extent do these symbols or metaphors serve to undergird and legitimize particular utopian projects, whether market liberalism, universal socialism, etc.? Yeah. So I'll start with that. Well, thank you, thank you, Margie, for that. All right. Jerome. I appreciate having that chance to, um, to talk to you all. So Jerome, to your questions. So I think one of the reasons that I find it worthwhile to spend so much time thinking about Polanyi is how he escapes the space of, you know, the ivory tower, the academy, epistemology, in the sort of narrow terms with which we usually think about these things, right? I mean, when we think about the sort of things he was engaged in, he was a person. He was a person who saw, I think, academic knowledge in, in, in something that didn't exist for its own sake, but was there as a kind of a resource to be drawn on for um, political mobilization, for rethinking specific challenges and specific conjunctures. And so, I take him in that spirit, right? I think I take him. Um, as uh, an occasion to, to ask similar questions about the present. And it seems to me that the thing that I ended the talk with, and this will maybe answer the second part of that question too, is um, related to that in the sense that it, I think it asks, if we are in a position now where we would like to tame the golem, right? If we would like to regain control over what it's what it feels like have been markets out of control, financialization out of control, um, the economy governing society instead of society governing the economy, again, these reversals we're familiar with, then how best can we think about this thing that we call the economy, right? We have two two options we're laid out in this, we're laid out in this talk. And if you think about it in relationship to my book, it's of a, of a piece there too. You either claim that the economy is something that is invisible or it's something that is monstrous, right? So either it is sublime beyond human comprehension in the Hayekian sense, in which case all we can do is defer to it and produce the forms of law and state that we believe encase it most effectively. And here I think about the work of someone like Katerina Pistor, talking about the way that certain forms of inequality and um, economic power are encoded in the law 
in ways that are often made to seem natural or invisible. So there's one project, right? The law is the law is the encasement for the sublime invisible economy. I think that's one way we can think of the problem of Hayek and neoliberalism, both as critics and indeed as, as advocates, as some people would see it. The other side is the Polanyan one we, we just talked about, right? Which is you say that the market and capitalism, when it grows too large, is grotesque and monstrous and therefore needs to be what? The question is what? Dismembered, turned into a system of regional quasi-autarchic spaces. That's a radical thought. That's something he was proposing. Um, tamed through the persuasion of the financial elite and the business elite that they are in fact intellectual workers and therefore should join the academics in bringing um, you know, runaway capitalism to heel. I would say that's the approach being, that's being taken every day in the pages of the Financial Times um, and indeed the meetings of the World Economic Forum. You know, give the golem a mind. Neither of these are entirely satisfactory for me. I mean, part of the reason I'm doing this is to sort of say, like, does that get us all the way there? I think partially the reason why it doesn't, as far as the reason I mentioned at the end, is the problem of the digital paradigm of both work and creation of value and um, connectivity that we now live in. I don't, I think that the golem is a is a is an antiquated idea of how capitalism operates. It's it's an it's a it's an artifact of the industrial age. Um, I think the challenge is to come up with the equivalent, a mobilizing, you know, even polemical depiction of how capitalism produces its own market, but one that can bring along with it the transformation of capitalism as it actually has unfolded. I think that the most successful version of this in recent years is, is Shoshana Zuboff's mm. Surveillance Capitalism book, which is just dense with metaphors. I mean, there's about seven on every page. Um, they're even more grotesque than the Gaul, right? I mean, she believes that, that our human <laughs> Existence is being is being sort of uh, scavenged by tech companies. Um, our our essence is being is being stolen from us. We are carcasses on the side of the road. She uses these kind of metaphors. I think these are also exaggerated or not or not productive um, in the same in the same way that they can give us a way into them. Right. I feel like they they catastrophize and 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 create monsters. In the same way that the golem does, but with, with even fewer productive inroads to um, to progressive change. So, I guess I would, in an elliptical way, respond to your questions that way. Is that for me, it's about trying to map out or create a new metaphorical landscape for our own interventions, inspired by, but not not beholden to anything that someone like Balani has written in the past. Thank you. There's a question uh, from Fred Block. Uh, it was a fascinating talk to be sure, but I'm interested in where you come down to the arguments about Polanyi's relation to Marxism and socialism. In stressing the continuity from Hungary, are you suggesting that he retained his allegiance to the professional managerial class as the agent of change? Yeah, I mean, I will certainly defer to uh, the you know the consummate student of Polanyi like Fred on the on the details of Polanyi's biography. So I have not spent decades studying him. I've spent a short time studying him. My impression, however, is that I I have yet to be convinced that there is any strong case to be made for the Marxist qualities of Polanyi's thinking and writing. I know that this is a heated topic of debate between people like Margaret and Fred and Hannes Lacher, for example, but I don't see it. I mean, when I read him, when I read him as a political activist and a public intellectual, it seems to me the through line from the 1918 period all the way into the 1960s is a kind of anti-Stalinism, uh, um, not you know an anti-actual existing communism. <laughs> If there are deep engagements with Marx's thinking, then I don't see them personally. I think I see more continuity with the work of 
the German Historical School of Economics probably than the work of Marx. I'm totally happy to be proven wrong on that. It's not something I'm gonna go to the mat over. Please just send me links and I'll, and I'll read up later. But it seems to me that this halfwayism, right? This, this, this um, middle road that he maps between commodification and decommodification, the sort of decommodification, but not of everything, commodification, but not of everything, would seem to me to run pretty directly against the message of Marx's thought, huh? unless I'm missing something. It seems to say that we can allow, you know, part of our social world to be colonized by the commodity logic, but we need to keep it within bounds, which seems to me a kind of left liberal reformism that doesn't really fit with Marxism. But again, not about to, not about to take a strong stance on that. And, and please just direct me to the best work um, arguing that Bolani was deeply informed by Marx. I think you just got yourself another invitation to uh, <laughs> enter into a debate and discussion um, with, uh, with Gareth Dale, Hannes Lacher, Fred Block, Margaret Summers. I think that this would be uh, a, a very interesting, um, a very interesting discussion indeed. Let me just pick up on because there, there isn't another question, and we have a couple of minutes. I just pick up on this um, uh, professional managerial class as 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 agent of change. Um, you know, in the archive, uh, which is so rich, and there's a hundred thousand uh, documents in in or pages in the archive. Um, what I found fascinating when I first began to work in the archive many, many years ago in the 1980s was all his writings on, on education and, and his um, engagement with the debates um, in Britain at the time on working class education, mm -hmm. education for change or, or education for politics. And he was, um, you know, very intent on, on the need for curriculum change, that the workers could not be agents of change unless the, the education reflected their realities. And so this was for him, you know, a very powerful political um, mm -hmm. uh, tool um, combined with, and he said that, you know, all workers should also have foundation, you know, basic foundation in, in finance and in history and so on, but that they don't recognize themselves in, in the education um, curriculum that exists. So there was a very deep commitment to workers as agents of change mm -hmm. uh, in the satanic mill England that he right. described at the time. Right, and that's, and that's just simply a place where I would love to hear more on some other occasion when we have more time to talk about though where he saw that as leading to, right? I mean, the question was, was there a vision at some point of the workers um, themselves controlling production and taking over the leadership role in society, the way that someone like Otto Neurath, of course, right, saw the whole project similarly of educating the workers in preparation for a worker-led society, full stop, right? Whereas it seems to me, based on what I've seen, that you know, Polanyi did continue to sort of um, admire the idea of a kind of an intellectual workerist caste that could be, you know, productively in a leadership role vis-a-vis -a, -vis a more enlightened working class. But was it the case that there would be this, you know, great reversal whereby the workers would now lead and those before would find their own previous work sort of discredited or move down the hierarchy. That's something I just maybe need to, you know, keep reading or get suggestions from to follow up on. Okay. Uh, I see we only have one minute. What I'll do is I'll just read you one other question that came in. And if you could just say, answer really briefly. Um, this is from Aman Banerjee. Fascinating comments. Thank you. Could you talk a little bit more about Polanyi foregrounding PMC as the political vanguard? How wide did he feel that engagement in physical work was likely to turn the worker into a golem? Uh, was this the notion that there would be no struggle or that there would be the wrong type of struggle? And what does this, in your view, suggest of any kind of notion of praxis in Polanyi's works and his conception of struggle in general? Could we do a Tell us. Sure, yeah, I mean, I'll just I guess I sort of, in a way, just address that. But um, 
but let's see. Um, I think that more or less it was it was a question of what containers for worker politics existed at the time. And at the time, the direction from Moscow, I think, was very discouraging for him. The experience of seeing the workers march into the First World War was very discouraging. So he felt at that point, right after the First World War, that workerism as a worker-centered politics was not doing well and perhaps needed to be replaced by something else. Whether he took different, I mean, clearly he his, his position transformed over the years, but I would like to see someone you know, pay close attention to whether or not that meant that he ultimately wanted to displace um, this PMC class, or if it felt that, that we were supposed to be entering into a partnership with the working class. It's something that I would just love to read up more about, but it's a great question. We've gone one minute over, and I, I think we could easily go an hour over. Thank you so much, uh, Quinn, <clears throat> for your very stimulating, inspiring uh, talk that raises uh, many issues, many questions, um, certainly in a very original uh, and unique take on, on Polanyi and, and this whole notion of of particularly the, the the goal, I like the metaphor of of the of the golem. Um, we will have your paper, I, I hope, and and that way we can read and reflect uh, more deeply and continue the conversation. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you to everyone um, who has attended this session, and uh, the next session starts in a little over ten minutes. Thank you, Quinn. Thanks so much. Yes, thank you. Thank Bye -bye. you, everyone. Bye.